ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानांजनि the the topic will be so you can look at the slide show which you have and i won't be sharing the screen because last time i was told that during the screen share the audio quality goes down so this is bhagavad gita 336 arjuna is asking athakena prayukto yam papam charati purushah anichchanapi varshneya baladivani yojitah so atha kena prayuktoyam by what are we impelled papam charati purushah by what are we impelled to do wrong anichchan apivarsh it is anichchan as if we as if we it's as if we don't want to do it we resolve not to do it but still we end up doing it balad even yojitah as if impelled by force so in this context let's take this verse part i'll talk it in three parts if you will see the context you know why do we sabotage ourselves do we have inner demons and how can we slay them so why do we sabotage ourselves we live in a world where there is a lot of hurt and we often live in fear we some terrorists will attack us if we are going on a lonely road some thieves will attack us nowadays in the digital world maybe there will be digital predators who will prey upon us they will steal our bank information or whatever and all these are real dangers but actually far more than people hurting us more and more we ourselves are hurt we are hurting ourselves that is the specter of self destruction or self destructive behaviors the self destructive behaviors can sometimes be very extreme where people succumb to dangerous drugs they can be milder where some 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 forms are socially acceptable they may be glamorized cigarette smoking was considered a sign of being cool at a particular time now even now in many cultures drinking alcohol is considered to be just a normal way of socializing and so but this all these can easily get people down and drag them down now self destruction in its most extreme comes literally in the form of suicide but i won't go in that direction today we'll talk that in when you talk about the concept of the mind more in detail in the sixth chapter but at this stage when we behave in ways that hurt ourselves so what makes us behave like this and what can we do to avoid it if you look at it throughout nature we see that sometimes living beings do certain things we go to the next slide now living beings do certain things by which by their own actions they get trapped so one is say uh, a mouse is caught by a cat and that's just the nature struggle of exi- for existence if the mouse is not fast enough and the cat is too fast mouse get the mouse gets caught but sometimes the mouse gets caught because of running for cheese it goes into a mouse trap or a fish gets caught by a bait now when this happens at such a time the it is we could say even these animals are running towards self destruction that it is because they run into the they run toward the trap they run toward the bait that they get caught and in some ways human beings are similar and we get into smoking or alcoholism or drug addiction 
then it is we who are doing something which traps us at the same time if we consider there are differences the actually the animals seem to be better than us humans that the animals have two excuses which we humans don't have the animals firstly they like they don't know in advance that it's a trap mice naturally eat cheese and they see the cheese lying over there somewhere and they go toward it they don't know in advance it's a trap and secondly they also don't know that uh, they they what they are attracted to also looks like food and for nobody nobody drugs or alcohol or cigarette looks like food for us humans it's our subsistence is very different the objects that nourish us are different from the objects for which we perish and not only that we all know that they are dangerous cigarette smoking is dangerous for health who doesn't know it when alcoholism people say they say that you drink but don't become a drunkard but when they start becoming a drunkard they know that there's a danger over there anybody who takes drugs they know so it seems that we human beings are destroying ourselves far more than what other living beings are uh, hurting or destroying us and the scale of this addiction is huge if we consider we have some statistics over there if you go to the next slide that we have so much of a the scale throughout history there have been some kind of intoxication by which people have been trapped so you see 1 million people around the world light up cigarettes 15 million people worldwide succumb to drugs and 240 million people around the world are are into alcohol in a destructive way so it's it's alarming numbers so what is it that makes us behave like this now of course what arjuna is asking is more specific atha kena prayukto yam papam charati purusha ha so the context is he is using the word papa is using the word wrong doing or sinful activity what makes us do that so the the context is we discussed in the second chapter uh, about the how we are not the body we are the soul then we discussed how that knowledge applies at various contexts and one of the things one of the ways in which we apply that knowledge is by living selflessly so selflessly is we work for a higher cause we talked about the principle of sacrifice in the last chapter so overall so now i am coming to the context of the gita before we go into deeper into the conceptions concepts that the gita is teaching so i started with overall that we do sabotage ourselves and when the gita raises this question that we sabotage ourselves the gita's context is slightly different arjuna is not necessarily talking about say somebody smoking or drinking although that was also a danger that was there but in the context of the gita what is arjuna is asking that he a krishna has spoken about how we need to live uh, we need to work in a mood of sacrifice we need to work with detachment and that way we can get elevated and liberated but if that doesn't happen then why does it not happen instead of living selfless selflessly why do we live selfishly instead of getting uh, instead of working with detachment we work work get attached and in fact we get so attached that we uh, we that attachment can ruin us so krishna when krishna speaks that arjuna work with detachment so the word used is nishkama that work without selfish desire selfish attachment and then arjuna is asking what makes us become attached what makes us do the things that we know we shouldn't do so that so arjuna's context is in terms of the bhagavad gita's flow at work with detachment but what is it that makes us attached and not just attached in ordinary sense attached in a terribly destructive sense also so now krishna answers elaborately <clears throat> and 
I will again now move back to the contemporary context and we will come back to the Bhagavad Gita's context again. So the question going on over here is what, what makes us act in destructive ways? And let's go back to the, if you go to the slideshow. Nowadays, many people talk about this that, do I have inner demons? When, uh, when Mike Tyson had, uh, he was fighting at one time and he, he got so angry when he started losing that he attacked his opponent and he bit off the ear of the opponent. It was bloody, brutal, ghastly. And he, afterward he said that actually I have demons inside me. So now this is a usage which comes not uncommon in today's world where sometimes people when they are just not able, then they do something terrible, they say there are, many, there are many demons inside me. Now what are they meaning by this? Actually, there is somehow we seem to do something which, which it's almost as if somebody else is doing it. And we ourselves see that sometimes we're just calm and gentle, but sometimes we start yelling at someone. And if that happens, then we may wonder, who is this person? Is this the same person or is this a different person? Sometimes we can become unrecognizable to ourselves. So when just like suppose somebody is haunted, somebody some generally we say houses are haunted and people are possessed. So if somebody is possessed by a ghost, so if somebody is possessed by a ghost and the ghost starts speaking from within them or acting from within them, and they start becoming, behaving in very uncharacteristic ways. So similarly, when people see that they are be, that they themselves are, uh, are behaving in a way which is very uncharacteristic, which is very different from the way they normally behave. And people start asking, what happened? Do, is there some demon inside me? Now the word demon can refer, if we consider that word literally or non-literally. Literally, it can mean, is there something within us, some being that possesses us and makes us do terrible things that demons can be creatures with horns or with fangs, ghastly looking creatures. Now that is not what is, most people don't have that in mind. And that is not what is being talked about in the Gita. But there are forces within us which are demoniac, which make us act in demoniac ways. And do we have demons in that sense? Yes. We have demoniac impressions, demoniac forces. In fact, it is demoniac forces that make demons who they are, demons. We'll talk about demons later on in the 16th chapter. But Krishna focuses more, not so much on the physical creatures called demons. He focuses more on the mentality that makes people demoniac. And he says that mentality can be there even in human society. So there are demoniac impressions within us which sabotage us. So now how does this happen? So if we consider... The Bhagavad Gita basically offers us a, a broad model of the self. There's the body, the mind and the soul. The three levels of reality. And these can be compared. You can go to the next slide now. You can compare the body with the... With the if you compare it to the computer system, the body is like the hardware. The mind is like the software. And the soul is the user. So body, mind and soul. Now, every action that we do, it creates an impression within us. And that impression comes back to us as a proposition. Now, if you can go to the slideshow, I have given an example here. How the software becomes programmed. Suppose somebody has repeatedly visited a particular website. Say they have visited bollywood.com repeatedly. Then, if now they come to a spiritual talk and they hear about Bhagavad Gita and they want to know what is Bhagavad Gita. So they visit bhagavadgita.com, but then they want to visit bhagavadgita.com, but as soon as they type B, Bhagavad Gita doesn't come up. Actually, Bollywood comes up as autocomplete. So why? Because they have chosen that earlier. 
and that's how the uh, the autocomplete comes up again and again so similarly for consider alcoholic suppose they go out to a to a shopping mall now they might have been going there to maybe to buy some clothes or buy some necessities but as they are passing by they enter the bar they sorry, they enter the shopping mall and when they enter the shopping mall they their intention is to go to maybe a supermarket or somewhere buy some groceries but then there is a bar over there so in the mind it proposes go to the bar go to the bar so they started off they went to the shopping mall to go to the buy groceries but they end up taking a drink and one drink becomes more than one drink it is said about alcoholism that first a drink first the drinker takes the drink then the then the drink takes another drink and then the drink takes the drinker so i am getting some comments here so just to information we had already shared the powerpoint on the whatsapp group and it's also here on the zoom group chat so i am not sharing screen you can look at the powerpoint link which has already been shared with you thank you mm. so so now the more time somebody does something repeatedly that much the impression becomes stronger and stronger and as the impression becomes stronger and stronger then the proposition that comes from it becomes more and more forceful in fact it becomes so forceful that the person doesn't even think about saying no you just do it instinctively and you just do it impulsively without even thinking so you can look at the next figure about how the physical level of reality is the mental level of reality Uh, at the level of the body we do actions when we do the actions they form impressions mm? and then from those impressions come propositions come on let's do it again let's do it again and then when we do it again there's repetition once twice thrice four times five times then that repetition leads to addiction so <clears throat> when somebody says they have inner demons what they essentially what is happening to them is that the inner impressions have become so strong and the propositions have become so swift that they just don't even think about resisting it and even if they think about resisting they can't resist it it's just too strong so that's how we become bound and now this leads to a question that say krishna uses the word kama kama is sometimes translated as lust but the way the bhagavad gita uses it kama is much more inclusive it is referring to self selfish self destructive desire and the word kama is also used in a positive sense in the broad vedic literature that dharma artha kama moksha kama is considered a desire which is naturally fulfilled during the course of one's life and which is worth fulfilling also that we'll talk about later but here krishna uses the word kama in the sense of selfish self destructive desire and now is say such desire uh is it is some something that we feel is it or is it something that is there inside us say for example if somebody now when we consider let's consider like we have lust we have anger now is anger just an emotion that we feel or is it also something tangible inside us now we may say everybody feels angry so that's a emotion but some people are more short tempered than others so they they snap off much faster so if emotion anger is a emotion that everyone feels then why is it that some people get more angry than others we say that's the that's the way they are but what exactly is different we are all souls at a spiritual level we are all similar so what makes us different so when if you consider the inner impurities the the vedic literature talk about six inner impurities called shadripus we can say these are the six inner demons lust anger greed and we pride and illusion among them the bhagavad gita focuses on three of them which are lust anger and greed which krishna will talk about in the 16th chapter in the 21st text where he calls them as the three gates to hell and as the three destroyers of the soul so 
now are they real things or are they just some feelings within us <clears throat> so is it that those who are short tempered or those who have uh, those who are more greedy or more lusty is it that they are some way different from other people is just they feel the emotion more it's not just that they feel the emotion more those impressions are also more within them so is lust or anger or greed a thing well it is not a physical thing it's not an object that we can pick up and show say this is like a phone this is lust it's not, or this is anger this is greed it's not like that it's not a thing in that sense but it is it is still uh, an object it is not just an emotion so what do I, what what do i mean by this exactly that just like if somebody is visiting bollywood.com or bhagavita.com they are making a choice to go toward bollywood or they are going to choice toward bhagavita but along with the choice that they are making by typing on the computer or on the phone similarly simultaneously there is a preference that is stored in their computer and that preference comes as auto complete or somebody who has not visited bollywood.com say then if they start typing b then it will not come and this preference significantly if you consider it is not stored just in the computer if we log in if we are logging in the computer using our gmail id then our preferences get stored not just on our computer but also with google and if we even if we shift from one computer to another computer as soon as we log in all those preferences will come there so similarly uh, these lust anger greed they are stored not just in the brain the brain will get destroyed at the end of the uh, our brain gets rewired by the way we function by the way we act and uh, that creates a lot of problems because the once the brain becomes the neurons that fire together they wire together let's say in brain science and when that happens then those kind of behaviors become even more easy in the neurons that are wired together the brain basically has brain cells in the brain cells there are axons and there are dendrites so two different brain cells they join together at the dendrites and where they join together where they join that's where information is passed so what happens is that if a person so if we consider an alcoholic's brain and a non alcoholic's brain then the brains are different and this is uh, this has been found out about various things nowadays uh, an increasing form of uh, internet addiction is is porn addiction and researchers have found that actually if somebody repeatedly consumes uh, obscene imagery through their eyes their brain gets rewired in a different way and when now we are not complete products of our brain wirings but if the brain is wired in a particular way then that kind of behavior becomes much easier much faster uh it, and of course the brain rewiring wiring can be changed rewiring is possible so the brain getting wired in a particular way is like the impressions being stored on our on our computer hmm. sorry is like the preferences stored on our computer but it's not just the brain that physically gets rewired the brain is a part of the body it's it's physical that the area in our skull where we can say the brain is there but beyond the physical body there is the mind and the mind is subtle and in the mind also impressions are formed so the impressions formed in the mind are like the like the preferences being stored with google so even if we go to a new computer and as soon as we log on to that computer all those preferences will come <clears throat> so similarly we bring our tendencies from a previous life to this life that's why say if parents have children they will find that two children no two children are the same although the children might be the same genetically or may share the same genes of the genes of the parents they are not the same entirely and even if they are even if they are twins and even if they are identical twins where one's eye got split into two but even then they are behaviorally different 
why because although physically they are same the mind of our the mind and its impressions are different so some children they some all children will cry but some children when they cry they cry it's the screaming it's like they will bring the whole house down by their crying is that kind of crying so what, the point of all this discussion is that we need to understand that by the inner demon usage is yes, demons as a malevolent being who is out to destroy us there are no demons in that sense yeah, when we are talking about lust anger greed and we we are not talking about some demon being there who is out to destroy us but it's not just a emotion that we have and we want to control it is yes we need to control it but it is a real thing it's a real impression inside us so just as somebody who has who is never visited bollywood.com there's no reference store then they don't have they can just go to whichever site they want they type that name of the site even it starts from b and they go to bhagavadgita.com but somebody who has typed bollywood.com for them to go to bhagavadgita.com as soon as they type b bollywood comes up and they have to exercise their energy to not go to bollywood the exercise there will because that temptation that allurement will come they have to say no to it and then they have to choose to go to bhagavad gita that's why for doing the same action different people may require different degrees of effort and so sometimes we need to be understanding in medical parlance in medical literature there is a question is addiction a defect or is it a disease is it a defect means this person simply has low will power and they keep doing the wrong thing wrong thing so it's just a defect come on have more will power and uh, just uh, just back up become strong and you'll give it up so is it a defect or is it a disease like if it's a disease then we may say that hey actually you can't expect somebody to cure a disease simply by will power that so if somebody is somebody is got lose motions you can't expect them to that bowel movements are improper uh, are unregulated you can't expect them to control it simply by will power so and then there is also a proper process required they have to go to a doctor they have to take the treatment and the treatment is what will cure them so similarly so so now for somebody who doesn't have whose bowels are fine they don't uh, they don't have to exercise any will power at all they they just they function in normal way but somebody's bowels are diseased then the will power alone is not enough for them they have to take a, so so the question is is addiction a defect that is a defect in person in people not using their will power properly or is it a disease so the answer is it's actually a defect which eventually becomes a disease so initially when the impressions are there but they are small they are they are not very strong then it's a defect we can say no to it if the temptation comes up but no i'm not going to do it and we say no and it goes away but for somebody the impressions are very deep rooted and just saying no doesn't work so it depending on the depth of the impressions that are there the particular negative habit might be a defect or it might become have become a disease now disease doesn't mean that the person is not responsible it's just that the the person also has to take responsibility just like in a normal disease sense the patient has to take responsibility for getting for getting cured but the patient's responsibility is not just increase their will power the patient's responsibility is to yes increase your will power so that you take the medication properly and then by the medication you'll get cured so this is with respect to the understanding of the inner demons now let's move to the last part how can we if there are inner demons how do we slay them so i have used the word deliberately the word slay to convey that actually krishna also uses the word slay toward the end of the third chapter in 343 he says evam buddhe param buddha संस्थव्यात्मात्मना 
win, defeat, kill, destroy. In fact, he uses the war metaphor right in the beginning itself. And Arjuna asked this question 336. What is it that impels me to wrong? Krishna says it is Kama. Kamesha Krodesha Rajoguna Samudbhavaha Mahashano Maha Papma Vidhyenam Ihavairinam Ihavairinam. Krishna says that this is your enemy. Not just your enemy, it is the enemy of the whole world. Like we discussed earlier, self destructive desires are a big, big danger for everyone in the world. And often people hurt themselves more than others hurt them. So the, uh, the, the war imagery, the personification that is used over here, personif it is for a particular purpose to help us recognize the gravity of the situation. So personification means that when something which is not exactly sentient, it is treated as if it is sentient. So we say the when there is a storm and a flood, it's, we may say the river roared as it charged into the village. Now the river is not literally roaring like a tiger or a lion. But the river, what happens is, when it's coming, it's threatening, it's huge, it's forceful. And the sound it makes sounds like a roar. Um, so, what's happening? <clears throat> that... Krishna is telling Arjuna that this is the enemy of the world. It's significant that the Bhagavad Gita is spoken on a war field. And Arjuna has to face physical enemies. Enemies who are out to destroy him and who have been out to destroy him for many, many years. Uh, there, is, there is Duryodhan, there is Karana, there is Dushasana. And now few of us will ever have enemies like that. We have, we have rivals, we have competitors. But few of us will have enemies who are out to physically kill us, who have tried to poison or assassinate us, burn us alive. Arjuna had that kind of enemies. And not only did he have that kind of enemies, those enemies were right in front of him, about to attack him. And at that time, Krishna is not mentioning anything about those enemies. He's saying, bigger than, more dangerous than those outer enemies are your inner enemies. So the context, it underscores, it emphasizes the gravity of what is going on, of how, of how serious the inner war is. The physical enemies can only kill us once they destroy our body. But the inner enemies, they can make us do things which destroy us, which destroy others, but they will carry on with us to the next lifetime. Somebody is lusty or greedy or angry, any kind of any kind of self-destructive behavior we have, it will go on, it will be an impression in our psyche, in our mind, and it will go with us to the next life. That's why Krishna uses the scary sounding word for such self-destructive desire. He calls it nitya vairina. In 339, he says, nitya vairina. So, eternal enemy. So, here eternal is used not literally in the sense of forever. It is used in the sense that it is exists lifetime after lifetime. So, for us, it's almost like eternal. So, now how do we deal with it? All this is to, okay, there's this inner enemy. We have to fight with it. The key question comes up, how do we overcome it? So broadly speaking, we can use another metaphor with respect to the impressions to understand this. I talk about three hours over there. They consider a floor. If the floor is inclined in a particular way, that if water falls on the floor, it will automatically flow in the direction of the inclination. Say if on this side, we have some expensive electronic equipment. And we don't want the water to touch there. Now just by saying, hey, the water don't go there. It's not going to stop the water from going there. That the water is still going to flow. So similarly, we can say our impressions form our inclinations. 
the kind of impressions that have formed inside us they make our consciousness inclined in particular ways when the consciousness is inclined in that way that means automatically our thoughts go in that direction say if somebody is very attached to cricket then as as soon as they have some spare moment you know consciousness as soon as they have their thoughts naturally flow their consciousness flows in that direction somebody is attached to politics then as soon as they have few minutes they pick up their phone and start looking for the latest political news so similarly somebody is alcoholic the their flow if somebody is an addict their flow is not just gently inclined it's 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 hugely inclined rapidly inclined so from the moment they wake up till the moment they sleep the, they just thinking about drinking and the thoughts naturally go there whenever they don't have anything to think about so now if the floor is inclined like this and the water is going to flow like that if we don't want the water to flow what do we do the three things broadly that is regulation or restriction we need to create some protective fence some wall when we create a wall then what happens by that by that the water doesn't flow up to the point of danger so if somebody is say an alcoholic then the regulation they need to have is i won't at the way if they are serious about getting up becoming recovering from alcoholism and the regulation they absolutely need is that you know, i won't keep any any alcohol in with me with me in my home or if their imagine if their home is right next to a bar well the they will succumb then. regulation means create some distance create some distance so whatever are the objects that tempt us we need to create a distance from them and uh, there are standard practices which are considered unhealthy and there are spiritual cultures which tell which tell us certain don't do certain things don't do certain things the idea is that those activities are like fences created they protect us so regulation means that we create a fence around ourselves and that fence protects us that fence ensures that even if the water comes the water doesn't go far away so krishna uh, so in the best way to deal with temptation is to not deal with temptation that means now it, you may say it's impossible to not deal with temptation yes that's true at some times but the point over here is that if we can avoid it then the whole agitation doesn't come up at all so if if somebody gets the urge to drink but they have no drink nearby then at least to that extent immediate indulgence is not possible so if we can create some boundaries that protect us then that is the first step and it is not never sufficient because even if somebody doesn't keep any alcohol next to them still they can always go and buy alcohol but some regulation helps suppose somebody has a tendency to surf the net excessively or indiscriminately then create some net filters install something which will regulate now some now somebody who is savvy enough can always uh, um, find a way through to uninstall or to bypass the filter and go that 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 can't be avoided but at least when the impulse comes if the immediate obje- immediately the object is not available then the fence can protect us to some extent so the fence ensures that even if our will power is not very active at all times sometimes our will power might go down or my intelligence might go down still the fence will protect us so that's regulation and every culture has some regulation or the other the principles of regulation are there so for example now sexual attraction is universal so every civilized culture has marriage so that's a fence that's a regulation and that way there is protection so first step is regulation then the second is redirection regulation is necessary but it is never sufficient uh especially say if the if the floor is inclined a little gently then the water might come the regulation stop it ends but if the floor is 
is steeply inclined and there is a fence then what happens the water keeps hitting keeps hitting keeps hitting eventually the fence will the more whatever border wall we have created that will get eroded so just regulation it feels like deprivation if you are only saying no 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 i will not do this i'll not do this i'll not do this so all the desire the desires are being generated the cravings are there but no 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 it doesn't work so regulation is the first step it is important but at the same time more important that is redirection so redirection means when our thoughts are going in a particular direction we need to push those thoughts in another direction and how do we do that so krishna talks about regulation in 340 41 in the bhagavad gita in 340 he says that where is this where are these impressions situated i talked about and these are not just some emotions that we feel their impressions are situated so he says they are situated indriyani mano buddhir asya adhishthanam uchyate etair vimoha yatyesha gyanam avrutya dehinam they are situated in our senses in our mind and our intelligence so they are situated inside us so the bhagavad gita does not approve the idea that we blame if we feel tempted we can't blame others for tempting us so it is it is not that if i feel tempted i can't blame somebody else that's not that that person is tempting me it is the temptations are there within me which are making me agitated when i see the particular stimulus outside so regulation means so krishna says in 341 tasmatam indriyanyadau niyamya bharat arshabha papamanam prajahi yenam yana vigyana nashanam so regulation indriyanyadau regulate your senses regulate your senses means don't let your sense senses dwell on sense objects too much so one way to do that is to not let the sense objects be there within the easy accessibility so the senses will not dwell on it and now regulation is important but regulation alone is not enough is redirection that means we need to direct our desires our thoughts our consciousness elsewhere and how do we do that just like if water is flowing in a particular way no we can't just tell water go back go back it won't work or even if it use our hands to push the water that's not going to work so easily what we need to do is actually we need some device maybe we need a brush a mop something with which you can push the water so similarly when we have developed a bad habit it's almost impossible to fight a bad habit every habit as it keeps keep getting that as we keep doing it it gains momentum and as it gets momentum it becomes so strong that to resist it becomes almost impossible so it's like say if we are on a road and there is a big truck that is charging down towards us then no matter how force how firm we are we can't stop the truck so like that our habits can gain such mass and momentum that they become like big trucks and they charge down on us and we can't stop it ourselves but if we get into another truck then we can move away also faster and we can counter also faster the the, the truck, oh I'll, i'll there's a big collision maybe i shouldn't come here so what is getting into another truck means don't try to fight with your bad habits try to create good habits and let those good habits fight with your bad habits so if you're saying no i will not think about this i'll not think about this not i'll think i'll not think about this that's like trying to fight a bad habit i will not do this i'll not do this i'll not do this but rather create a good habit have something else to think about have something else to do that's like getting into another truck and so now what good habits can we cultivate that we could say there are unlimited number of good habits which we could all cultivate but what are most easily cultivable for us so what is a suitable brush or a mop by which you can push the water up the roof so that is where this we have to find out i talked about if you look at the slide show there are two circles things that we like and things that are good for us if you find out where these two intersect then doing that activity is beneficial and it's also enjoyable so if somebody likes music then then when the mind gets agitated because of some craving at that time if they just turn keep some music accessible to them some music is good but music can also be sensual 
so music is uh, what they feel good about but it, there can be spiritual music also so then music and spiritual music they inter, and spirituality spirituality is what purifying uplifting so music and spirituality can intersect in spiritual music so keep some spiritual music accessible to you hear that make a habit of hearing that and when you become attached to that then when the mind gets agitated you just turn toward that turn on that spiritual music sing that or hear that or if you like to like some philosophy like some wisdom quotes like some intellectual stimulation then have something which is intellectually stimulating at the same time spiritually uplifting keep that readily accessible so when the water comes down we can't just push it back with our hands now of course if the water is very little and the floor inclination is also very less then we could just push it back with a little effort that's like when it's a very small impression and a very gentle proposition comes up then at that time the self destructive or just it's like a defect in our will power a defect in our will power means we are just choosing wrongly it's defective correct it but when it's become a disease that means it's become very strong and you have to push it back with great force and we can't ourselves push it back so that's redirection so we all need to find out how we can redirect our consciousness and krishna talks about this again in 343 evam buddhe param buddhva with your intelligence situate yourself on the spiritual platform so krishna is not just saying situate yourself on the spiritual platform but use your intelligence to find out how you can situate yourself on the spiritual platform most effectively so what may situate me on the spiritual platform may be different from what situates you on the spiritual platform because each one of us is an individual and we have to find out these two circles and where they intersect so finding that is the use of our intelligence and then lastly is reconstruction now reconstruction means the floor is inclined like this if we made the floor flat then the water won't flow that much in this direction or if we wanted the water to flow in this direction and if we made the floor like this inclined in a different way then the water won't flow in this direction at all so that that talks about changing our impressions so when we are doing redirection but if we do it through the practice of bhakti then every devotional activity that we do that is creating positive impressions within us every time we study the bhagavad gita every time we chant the holy names every time we behold the lord in darshan every time we do some seva these are creating impressions within us and those impressions will come up as propositions and if we keep doing these with adequate investment of consciousness then these impressions will come as default propositions so as soon as we have some some spare time immediately so maybe let me pick up a bhagavad gita and read it let me do something spiritual let me do something devotional then that is the time when our inner floors inclination has changed away from the temptations of this world toward the lord and when that has happened that's when we can become purified that's when we won't even feel the inner battle that's when our inner enemies will be slayed and then our our life can become much more peaceful and much more joyful peaceful because this inner demons won't be tormenting us and joyful because we are connected with the lord with krishna who is all attractive and we can become absorbed in him and find joy therein so i'll summarize i spoke today on the topic of are there inner demons i took in three parts first of all uh, i talk about self destructive behavior how millions and millions of people are addicted today and uh, we talked about how humans seem to be worse than animals with respect to self destruction a cheese looks like food for a mice and mouse and it doesn't know its bait it's a trap but we know and our what we are attracted to alcohol or drugs or smoke or cigarettes they don't look like food to anyone we know they are dangerous so why is it that we destroy ourselves like this so arjun is asking a similar question in the context that we want to work self self we are told to work selflessly but we work not just selfishly but self destructively so what makes us do that and then we discuss the answer in terms of are there inner demons so demon if we consider demons as creatures with horns and fangs outside who enter us and possess us well not exactly uh, but there are demo, there are demonic impressions within us and i talk about how 
habits are formed every action creates an impression that impression leads to a proposition and when that proposition leads to action then the impression becomes stronger and when the impression becomes extremely strong then the time lag between the proposition and the action the proposition comes very strong and swift and you just give in to it so uh, <clears throat> that's uh, so we talk about the mind is like the software the body the hardware and the soul the user so when we visit a particular website that gets stored on a computer preference computer as well as with google so it's like that whatever we do repeatedly our brain gets rewired accordingly and that kind of behavior becomes easier becomes our default behavior and not only that our mind also is impressed accordingly and even if we leave this body this brain is destroyed we go to the next body the impressions will be there and they will bring propositions and that's how we'll be impelled towards similar actions so how do we deal with this we talked about three steps with using the floor metaphor and the floor is inclined in a particular way and the water is flowing in that direction to stop it first regulation so we need to create a wall we need to keep a keep the temptation that agitate us from a distance at a distance as much as possible and then redirection we can't fight our bad habits we have to create good habits and let those good habits fight bad habits other other thing i won't think of this we have to find out what am i going to think about what am i going to do so find this intersection of things we like to do and the things we are things that are good for us and find some anchor within that find something within that and lastly reconstruction means by the practice of bhakti not only can we redirect our thoughts but we can redirect uh, our attachment itself so once we become attached to krishna then our life becomes peaceful because the inner demons don't torment us anymore and it becomes joyful because internally we can naturally spontaneously connect with krishna and become absorbed in him thank you very much hare krishna so i can see there are some questions well this is a common question that are there first demons were living in different planets and then the demons are living on the same planet now demons are living in the same heart this is a this is there are many things which go around in spiritual circles which often don't have scriptural basis this is one of those and it doesn't make logical sense also because the divine and demoniac mentalities have always been there throughout history so uh, there is there is even in the past ages when people were pure still the demoniac mentality was there it might not be that prominent now it is much more prominent is it that we all have in the past people were able to control better yes they might have been that's primarily because <clears throat> the demonic impressions were lesser now this is a little complicated question about say split personality disorder or bipolar is it that some other personality has occupied them that person it could be it may not be once we start going into this particular zone is some is a somebody the bipolar disorder or split personality disorder has somebody some other being occupied them in general no explanation should be used to outsource responsibility to someone else what we need is that whatever a person requires for dealing with the problem that they are facing those resources need to be provided for them now prabhupad was once asked for devotee one devotee wrote letter to his prabhupad i think that i am possessed by a ghost prabhupad said no you are just having a weak mind so uh, we don't want to jump to paranormal explanations at the first first opportunity in general the impressions are there and in, in some in some people if the impressions are very deep rooted then that can almost appear like a different person inside them which acts in a different way so in general it is just the impressions which are uh, impelling them and somebody can be overall can be overall a pure person but with respect to one particular thing they can become not just impure but brutal sometimes so 
it doesn't have to be a split personality but sometimes it is possible so it has to be based on a case to case and one has to so uh now when temptations are gone does it mean that they still exist at a deeper level or have they actually gone and this again depends there is of course a stage where we do become completely free from temptations but it is best to assume that we have not come to that stage and to always be on guard so the because there is no flashlight that we have by which we can look within our inner world to find out whether those uh, temptations have disap they have just uh, gone to sleep or they have died they have become eliminated or they just become uh, regulated but we don't have to we don't have to ever put ourselves in tempting situations to find out it's like if we see a big tiger lying motionless on the ground now is it asleep or is it dead well at least it's not hurting us that's good let's move away from it if somebody think they will go and twirl the mustache of the uh, may pluck the hair of a tiger to check whether it is alive well the tiger tiger will wake up and they may not have been alive so generally it is when we are we may in the normal course of life we may not feel tempted but when great provocations come up do we get tempted that's when it will be revealed whether we have uh, those those impurities that just become dormant or they have become eliminated but we don't have to deliberately put ourselves in such provocations it's best to assume be humble and assume the impurities are there and just try to uh be grateful that they are not awake and tormenting us but no need to become proud thinking that they have become eliminated be cautious so be grateful and be cautious always okay, there are a lot of questions here i think we are running out of time so i'll just take one or two questions that are directly related other questions i will answer uh, separately so if somebody is addicted to subtler things like say somebody is we term it's approval addiction we want people to praise us we want people to like us and we don't want we won't want people to we get hurt very easily say we are hypersensitive <clears throat> see the word addiction there's a debate also i mean the medical circle for what all can we use the word addiction so there is a clinical sense of the word addiction and there is a general sense of the word addiction so we have to see in what context we are using the word nowadays it is often used in a general sense so somebody says okay you know i'm addicted to i'm addicted to cricket now what does that mean exactly there are clinical definitions of addiction and that's not exactly it does that mean that the person who is addicted to cricket has cricket has to go to some rehabilitation clinic and live over there to get free of addiction not necessarily but so we can use the word generically for a irresistible attachment we can call it as addiction but it has to be contextualized properly but the important thing is whatever it is if you this 3r principle can work and if we want if we don't if we are very sensitive we don't want people to speak to hurt us or people want people to praise us we have to look deeper within to find out what it is that that is our need and see every craving every unhealthy craving is a is a distorted expression of a healthy need so most of all when people overeat usually people overeat because something is eating them they have some unprocessed emotion they have some unresolved issue some tension and to that to to just move away from that discomfort within their lives they are they are pseudo medicating themselves with food so we need to become more introspective to understand ourselves better so when we want approval from others what does it mean that is it that maybe in our childhood somebody had constantly criticized us 
and we grew up thinking that our success in life is to be approved by some xyz person and if you are not approved then we feel that oh my life is worthless so we need to try to find we need to do some introspection to find out what is the healthy need so often say somebody has uh, somebody has lust issues so often it is not so much lust as something deeper within which is a healthy need i'm going to talk about this aspect of our behavior how pure love for god get distorted into various things here the focus was more on dealing with addictions at a level of uh, at a psychological level with spirituality as a resource for the transformation but at a spiritual level to understand where our desires originate from and where they can be fulfilled that will be we'll be discussing in the 7th chapter of the gita but you we have to set boundaries with respect to say if we are uh, we are attracted to approval from others then we can set boundaries that what kind of people's approval do we value now if there are demoniac people and if they praise us then you may think maybe they are doing something wrong why are these people appreciating me for it so we if we if we seek the appreciation every need for appreciation is not just a craving of the ego as human beings we want to be we want to belong we want to be accepted we want to be valued so that can be a the the human heart's need for acceptance and appreciation is different from the ego's need for pampering and glorification so if we regulate whose appreciation do we seek and value and then those people if they are people with with character with principles then trying to do act in a way by which they appreciate us that will also help us to become better human beings and in general we have to find out the people who value us there is some people who will never value us no matter what we do so this is a principle in relationships on which there is a, we will talking later also but i have a gita daily article on my gita daily website that is don't overvalue people who devalue you and value people who value you so if we decide this way don't overvalue the people who are never going to who always devalue you but find out the people who value you and if they are also having good values then value them and then there we can have our need for appreciation fulfilled so thank you very much hare krishna